In Still's own words, he says, I never wanted color to be color. I never wanted texture to be texture or images to become shapes. I wanted them all to fuse together in a living spirit. Unlike other artists who had a kind of visual or aesthetic promiscuity and kind of shifted from one way of working to another or experimented with materials or experimented with application, still was absolutely pure and rigorous to his calling, to his study of the edge, to his meditation on texture, color, to his commitment to his language of abstraction. I was lucky enough to grow up in Buffalo, New York, and there's not a lot of people that would come on air and say that. But uh, I was lucky enough to grow up in Buffalo, New York, which is home to a superb art museum called the Albright Knox. And at that museum, there is an exceptional collection of Clifford Stills because Still had such a close relationship with Seymour Knox. And until the Clifford Still Museum was built in Denver, it was home to the largest singular holding of Clifford Stills' work. So I spent a lot of time as a child looking at the Clifford Stills to really try to understand where the artist was coming from. And I would say that Still was looking for something that would always feel edgy, like you were on the verge of some incredibly, completely new language. Like there's not a single thing about Still's work or the way he worked that feels dated. In fact, it would still be as radical today if an artist were making these paintings. This work dates from 1948, which is really the pinnacle of Still's career. He's really at his most active and precise creatively in terms of really developing his language and hitting the right pitch. So among his peers, Clifford Still was probably a bit of an outsider to the group of abstract expressionists. He was a little bit of a loner, kind of quiet and meditative in his way. He didn't feel like he needed to be in New York as the center of his career. I think he cared very much about his paintings. I think he cared much less about the perception of him or his reputation. I don't think he was distracted by that at all. But there's something about the character of Clifford Still that's a very American story. You know, he, he's a bit peripatetic. He at once wants to capture the limelight and be well known for what he does, but at the same time avoids it. And he sees a kind of publicity as a kind of gimmickry in the end. I think painting for him was a practice, sort of the way we talk about yoga or meditation. Um, rather than an act, it was a practice. He wanted the work to always look a little extraterrestrial, a little otherworldly. He never thought for a second that it was easy on the eyes or it would become decorative. I think other artists working in the abstract expressionist vein in these periods could sort of reconcile the prettiness of their works with the, with the zeitgeist and bravura they wanted. But I think for Still, he, he would have eschewed that for sure. He wanted it to always look a little otherworldly. And indeed it does. It sometimes reminds me of the surface of the moon, actually, the cragginess and the edgy jaggedness of each form. What strikes me so much about this work, and one of the things I love the most about this work, is that there are a few paintings by Still that are complete meditations on the study of color. Uh, what does that mean? While he claims not to be interested in color any more than he's interested in form or texture or edge condition, this one is special to me because the ochre and the shades of ochre and the burgundy, which is a kind of a stand-in for red, and that very beautiful shock of Eve Klein royal blue become a meditation on the primary colors in a way that's sort of stark and elemental and pure and even rigorous intellectually. This painting has the exceptional provenance of having been bought from the famed critic and art dealer Ben Heller in 1982. Compellingly enough to me, this particular shade of ochre has massive association. It is at once associated with earth. It is uh, golden like wheat or like autumn leaves turning yellow. It also very much has the feeling of a Monet haystack or a Van Gogh sunflower. It's a very archetypal color in that it's something we recognize without having a lot of intellectual knowledge because it is such a color in nature and in plant life so often we see the shade of ochre. Another dynamic element of this painting is the incredible use of the palette knife. Still, of course, revered the palette knife. The palette knife had a sense of accident and chance in terms of how it would behave or how the paint would behave as it was sort of sliced and placed and 
spread, smeared, if you will, across the canvas. And he liked that about it. He liked the sort of depth and texture he could get from the palette knife. It also became formal. It has a form almost like a sculpture um, because it does have that relief quality. The Clifford Still in the Marion collection, it keeps company so well with so many other wonderful works in the collection. At the same time, I think it's one of those bold, singular tastes that Anne Marion made, uh, just very bravely saying, I'm gonna have a Clifford Still. That wasn't a super popular choice in 1982. It wasn't a very obvious choice in 1982. And um, it's a star of the collection. It's a fantastic work.